All right, and again, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, webinar, Prepare for Impact, Getting Multi-Channel Right for Your Business. Uh, my name is Brian Munson. I am the Business Development and Dot Co-op Sales Manager for NCBA Clusa, and I will be today's webinar moderator. Your webinar today is co-hosted by Real Results Marketing. Uh, just a quick bit of background here. Prepare for Impact is our exclusive webinar series that will explore the key issues that will shape our 2017 Co-op Impact Conference. Impact will be held uh, October 4th through the 6th in Alexandria, Virginia. And uh, given that marketing the co-op identity is one of the top challenges listed by our uh, purchasing co-op members specifically uh, that are planning to attend this conference, we've, we've created a four-part series that uh, includes today's topic. Our first two webinars uh, examined campaign development, developing assets, and, and then part two looked at you know how to merchandise your store, uh, how to localize your marketing efforts. Um, our final segment will be in September, and that will look at social media. Just a quick bit of housekeeping. Uh, participant phone lines are muted during the presentation to reduce background noise. Uh, that being said, if you have a question, you can type it into the question box on the GoToWebinar control panel. And as those come up during the presentation, uh, we're happy to answer those. Um, NCBA Clusa is recording this program. It will be archived on our website you will receive an email containing a link to the posted recording tomorrow. Uh, so please be sure to listen to it. Again, share it with friends, family, colleagues, anyone that uh, you think would uh, enjoy the information and find it helpful. Um, so very quickly, our panelist today is Jonathan Bine. He is a partner at Real Results Marketing. Jonathan has a PhD in computer science uh, from the University of Colorado with a focus in data intensive uh, systems, and he also has a BA in computer science at Indiana University. Uh, how does that all relate to marketing? Well, Jonathan has worked with many distributors throughout his career uh, to help uh, make their mar marketing a profit center. So he's taken his computer skills and data skills and, and blended it with, uh, with purchasing and distribution. So specifically, he's developed and applied analytic approaches for customer segmentation, customer lifecycle management, positioning and messaging, pricing, and of course, channel strategy, which is why we're here today. So uh, we're very excited to have Jonathan. And uh, at this point, I'm gonna turn the webinar over to you, Jonathan, and we can get started. Thank you, Brian, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, just a quick thing, since the, the audience is relatively smaller, if you have questions, I will try to answer them um, as we are, um, as you are making the question rather than waiting till the end. So please don't hesitate to, to jump in. As background, we, we do a lot of uh, market research on what and customers want to do on what distributors do. And as a result of that research, we've, we've come to a certain perspective about really what's happening with, with multi-channel. Now, many of us have heard about e-commerce and we've heard a, a drumbeat that says, well, you've got to have e-commerce or else. And we, we've heard that drumbeat kind of for so long that we're almost hardened to it. We almost don't really take it in anymore. But when, when I look at the broader perspective, based on all this research that we do, um, there are a handful of things that we see that I'll cover in more detail that we, that we think suggests there's a, there's a meaningful um, change that's going to occur over the next couple of years. Um, and so what we want to talk about today is, is how to think about that change. A lot of what I'm going to be looking at is about distributors, but the, 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 the way to think about it generalizes to, to other uh, businesses as well. The first thing is that <clears throat> field salespeople are leaving the workforce. There is a drain of talent of field salespeople. I'll show some stats on that, on, I think, on the next slide. Second thing is that the way people shop for products, and when I say shop, I mean evaluate, assess, research, uh, separate from how they buy, meaning purchasing, ordering, transacting. The way people shop and buy varies significantly based on the generation. I think we know that the older generation, of which I'm a part, I'm, a, I'm at the very tail end of the boomers, Gen X, they shop and buy different from millennials and Gen Z. We'll take a look at that. 
A third thing is that there's still plenty of opportunity in e-commerce, um, but for those that have not yet started, we think it's critical to, to start moving in that direction um, because it does take a while. <clears throat> Fourth thing is that your field salespeople need to be adding value. The, the role of field sales just taking orders um, is, is diminishing or the window for that, the value in that is diminishing significantly. Customers are expecting more. When we look at the totality of these points, we really believe that there's a tipping point that's going to happen in the next two to four years. So <clears throat> the drumbeat of you better get with e-commerce or you better get with this or that digital thing or some other channel, we really think is going to happen because of all of these things, because of what's happening with field sales, because of the influx of millennials and Gen Z, um, because of what customers are expecting. We think the shift is going to happen over the next two to four years. The key thing from all of this is that getting this right is, in many cases, critical for competitive advantage. And in some cases, it may even be critical for survival of the business. Next slide, please. So the um, <clears throat> Forrester Research did a study on what's happening with sale, salespeople. And this is across many, 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 many B2B sector, sectors. So this is not specific to distribution. And if you look at the thing up on the right there, it says, according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor, in 2012, there were four and a half million B2B salespeople. Forrester believes that a million of those salespeople <clears throat> will lose their jobs to self-service e-commerce by 2020. Um, some of it is, is just natural retirement, um, people folding, you know, flowing out of the workforce, but they're not being replaced is the key idea, idea here. And when you, when you think about what the different salespeople do, the Forrester research has broken it down into two things. One is the complexity of the product or service that's being sold. And then another is the complexity of the buyer dynamic. So if we think about uh, an enterprise business with lots of different aspects to the business, uh, different people involved in the purchasing process, that would be a more complex buyer dynamic. Um, by contrast, a consumer buying something <clears throat> would be a low complexity of the buyer dynamic or a small business with just a few employees. There are two of the quadrants here that I think are relevant. The first is the lower left. So it's low complexity of product and service, low complexity of the buyer dynamic. The buyer basically says, serve me. And, and the, the salesperson is doing things related to order taking. As you can see, there's very little, if any, value added. <clears throat> and however, when you when you look at your sales force, you may find that you're paying very good money for people who are essentially taking orders. The other quadrant is the upper right. So we have a high complexity of product service, high complexity of the buyer dynamic. The buyer says, "Enlighten me." And um, there, the the salesperson is playing the role of a consultant. That's the direction where a lot of the B2B stuff is going. That's where the value add is going. And the other three quadrants are seeing a reduction in force um, over that eight-year period. And that consultant quadrant, that upper right quadrant, is seeing a growth. So if you want to see where things are going, maybe think about how, how this applies to your business and um, what you could be doing to shift towards the upper right, right-hand quadrant. Next slide, please. Another thing that we've heard is the millennials are coming, the millennials are coming, the millennials are coming. Well, they're here. This is a chart from 2015, and it was, um, the, the source was the Labor Department. It appeared in the Wall Street Journal. What you can see is that as of 2015, the millennials, which would be at that point, ages 18 to 34, already outnumbered the boomers, already. And the millennials, as of 2015, already outnumbered the Gen X, which is that age 35 to 49. <clears throat> so if we roll it forward, 
with with some of the boomers retiring with more millennials coming in millennials will will be much greater than boomers they will be the dominant part of the workforce millennials plus gen z which is that uh, sort of pastel blue color there on the, on the lower left they will significantly outnumber gen x there's a couple things about millennials that are important first of all many of them have grown up with digital they um they they haven't seen an lp player unless dad or mom just said it has to be analog and they got hooked on analog lps or reel to reel tapes or something so, so they haven't seen these things they've grown up with digital they do things differently i was talking to a ceo of a company recently who had a very astute observation about millennials he said millennials don't bookmark things in their browser they use search to find things. I don't know about you, but I've got a very well organized set of bookmarks and folders for bookmarks and I manage them carefully. <clears throat> and search is definitely not the way I do things um, in terms of, of, of information I want to get back to. So that's just one example of how millennials and Gen Z are different than this later generation. And we have to really, it's, it's not, you know they're coming they're here now and so we really have to start addressing how to do business with them or we're going to lose opportunities next slide please so when we look at how they shop remember meaning searching or evaluating assessing researching um we did a study in fact it's an ongoing study um of 8,000 customers of distributors and we looked at 10 different ways they shop and 10 different ways they buy. Suffice it to say, their profile of how they shop and buy is different than boomers and Gen X. There's a much heavier emphasis on digital. So it shows at the top, half start by search. Uh, only a third would go to a, a, a distributor website. Even a smaller percentage would call a sales rep or talk to a sales rep. And then when we look at how they actually buy or purchase, one of the things that really surprised us was the huge emphasis on sending orders via email. Here's what I mean. A purchase order is created, it's, crea it's converted into a PDF or some type of other format and it's attached to an email and it's sent to somebody um, on the supplier or, or vendor side. 52% say that's how they very frequently do it, out of 10 methods. And then the next thing is also digital, much lower emphasis on CSR, which stands for customer service representative. So the, the, the profile or, or, the, or the thumbprint, if you will, of millennials is much more digital than the older counterparts. I'll give you a, another contrasting idea here, which is, I have a 17 year old son from whom I didn't receive email for a year and a half, except under duress or under threat of revocation of privilege. If you have children or deal with people that age, you, you might be aware that they, they don't use email, email very much. They text. Facebook was a couple of generations ago. <clears throat> um, but that is a private persona. What this data is telling us is that their professional persona says we're gung-ho, we're even more gung-ho about email than our older counterparts. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so we see a number of, of margin and revenue pressures in the distribution world and it, it probably generalizes to other parts of the business world as well. The first is, if you either don't have an e-commerce platform or it's not good enough, you may lose three to four, maybe five points a year. And we think that's a three, three to four to five points of revenue a year. And we think that's a conservative number and it's compounded. Um, so it's gonna occur for a couple of years in a row. The second piece is the gradual loss of revenue from manufacturers selling direct. We did a, a study this year, uh, this last year, um, on e-commerce 
and we ask both manufacturers and distributors what they're doing with e-commerce. For manufacturers, what we ask them is, to what extent are you selling to the end customer and to what extent are you selling to the channel? Long and short of it is only 40% were selling only to the channel um, with their for, with, with e-commerce, <clears throat> um, which means that 60% of the manufacturers who responded are in some way selling directly to end users. This changes the the age old understanding, which is as a manufacturer, I'm gonna sell direct to the largest clients, the largest end users, and you channel people understand that I'm gonna sell direct. Uh, your role as channel is to sell to everybody else. So now manufacturers are starting to change that, that uh, long-term understanding. <clears throat> a third thing that we're seeing in distribution is what's happening with Amazon. And if we think about price buyers, price buyers are those who care only about price. They, care, they don't care about value. In the world of distribution, Amazon supply or Amazon business is starting to take a lot of that business because the price buyers know they can get the best price there. So a question to ask for your members is, what does this mean to me? We, we know that price buyers aren't contributing <clears throat> huge margins, but they are contributing volume, which factors into rebates and, and discounts with suppliers. So question is, what percentage of price buyers could you afford to lose before it hurts you if they were to shift to a national or global um, distributor? The other end of the spectrum is what's happening with relationship buyers. So relationship buyers are those who are least sensitive to price. For them, it's about the relationship. With a relationship buyer, you tend to have a very high percentage of their wallet. When you sell to them, it's often sole source or maybe there's one other competitor, but you're getting a lot of their business and they tend to be higher margin. They've been with you for a while. Typically, when we look at a customer base, four to five percent of the customers are relationship buyers. However, they represent a substantial portion of the revenue. So in a similar question, in a similar way to the price buyers, the question would be, if, if, <clears throat> if relationships are now formed differently, if millennials and Gen Z don't quite have the relationships we, relationships we had, how much of your relationship buyers would it take to hurt you if they became value buyers? So a value buyer is looking for the greatest delta or distance between value and price. They're not, they're not looking for the lowest cost, they're looking for the biggest distance between price and value. So if some of these relationship buyers, because they don't have relationships as much anymore, became value buyers, how much of that would it take to hurt you? So when we add up all of these things, um, we think it could easily be five to seven, eight or nine points of pressure, pressure per year, revenue and margin pressure, and it's compounded in some way. And the concern for potentially some of your members is what I call an eat lunch, be lunch, or die scenario. If you are unable to deal with these revenue and margin pressures, the value of your business goes down to the point where you get consumed by a bigger player. If, it, if the value goes down so much because of these revenue and margin pressures, you die. So, so there's a difference between, be, be, between being eaten and dying. Being eaten, you're actually, you're actually consumed into uh, a bigger business and you, you, you live on in some way. Um, but if, you're, if your business, if the value and the, and, the pro, and the profitability is so low because of these pressures, you won't even get consumed and you will simply die. So that's my concern. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so McKinsey had a, did a study of the effect of digital on businesses. And what they found um, was looking at front office, middle office, and back office. And, and they have a way to assess maturity. So they can, they can look at a business and, and they've got metrics where they assess the maturity. Those that were in the sort of upper 25% of digital maturity <clears throat> had five times higher revenue growth 
eight times higher EBIT growth and then 80% higher return to shareholders. An obvious question is, okay, well, so to what extent are these companies experiencing these, re these returns, these benefits because of digital? And to what extent is it just, hey, that's what these companies happen to be doing, but they're not necessarily experiencing return. Another way to say that would be, to what extent is it causal versus correlation? Probably some of both, but it's, it's quite noteworthy uh, how much these companies are outperforming their, their counterparts. Next slide, please. We did a, a study um, that asked about performance of marketing for distributors, and we compared it to a study that was done by Salesforce.com. And essentially, the respondents were classified as high performer, moderate performer, and underperformer. What you can see there is that the SFDC, that's Salesforce.com, had 18% high performers versus distribution, which only had 5% high performers. One perspective is distributors suck at marketing. And having worked with many, 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 many distributors, I can say that that is generally true, also having done benchmarks with distributors. But another perspective is there's a huge opportunity to, to leapfrog um, and actually build a competitive advantage by creating a, a marketing capability. Mind you, this marketing capability doesn't have to be best in class because you're trying to leapfrog competitors who are not very good at this. It's a little bit like the joke of the two guys that see a bear in the woods and one guy starts to run, the other guy puts on, starts to put on his tennis shoes and the guy who started to run says, you don't think you're gonna outrun the bear, do you? The guy who's putting on his tennis shoes says, no, I don't, I just need to outrun you. So this, you don't need to outrun Amazon. You need to outrun uh, your competitors. Um, and you may, not, you may not be able to outrun the best competitor, but you can probably outrun a number of competitors by building a high performance marketing capability. On the next slide, we're gonna see a little bit about, about how these high performers differ. In distribution, what we saw for the high performers was they're much more intensive about digital marketing. And so when I say digital marketing, I mean search marketing, I mean using email, I mean using social media. When we look at many companies, manufacturers, distributors, um, tr trade contracting companies, Many companies do these activities. They do email, search marketing, and social media, but the high performers do them much more intensively. So they may be doing them at least weekly, if not daily, versus the rest of the population, which is doing them maybe once a month, twice a month, maybe sporadically. So it's about the intensity of it. They have people who are dedicated to, to doing this. The second thing that we saw was that the high performers place much more emphasis on daily telemarketing. I'm going to talk a little bit more about telemarketing in, in a later slide, but it's essentially creating an outbound capability um, that, is, that is proactively generating demand. In terms of traditional marketing mechanisms, you see that the, the high performers put less emphasis on trade shows. And I think many of us have had the experience of going to a trade show and we have a kind of post-performance high and we look at the business cards that got dropped in our, in, our, in our bucket at the trade show. And then we often see very little that comes out of that uh, actual experience. So um, it's not that trade shows shouldn't be done, but if you see here, the high performers are placing less emphasis on trade shows, probably doing them less frequently. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Um, so, I, I'm, we've looked at a lot of companies that, that do e-commerce, and there's all kinds of reasons why people say, well, we just, we can't do it. And I'll, I'll just read through them and I'll comment on a couple of them here. One is that it's going to, it's going to disrupt what's happening with field sales. And some of the, some of the field salespeople might actually quit. The next one would be, well, where, where do we get the product data? <clears throat> to drive the e-commerce initiative. 
And just a comment to some of you who are running uh, co-ops, you know, we, we are aware of co-ops that are, that are collecting and gathering product data on behalf of their members. Uh, and that's a very powerful thing that, that's a very powerful thing that, that co-ops can do. A third thing that we hear is, yeah, well, we, we, we have a, we're okay. We, we can compete against Amazon and Granger. They can't do what we do. Um, and it might come down to something like, well, you know, Amazon can't deliver big things of cement, or um, I've got a client that does gas and welding, and it'll say, well, Granger can't do, can't do, can't create gases. So we have some kind of moat. But the reality is when you push on that moat, you find that there's a part of your business that is completely vulnerable to these bigger players, even if you have a moat around the core part of your business. So in the case of this company that is, does gas and welding, they like to sell tools and safety equipment. That's absolutely in Amazon and Granger's sweet spot. And so if, if a company lost a significant portion of that tool revenue to Amazon and Granger, it would hurt them. Another objection that we hear is, well, customers don't need it. We're just not hearing that from our customers. And I would argue that you need to find out, you need to get the voice of your customer to really find out what's going on there. And are you hearing that from your peer group who are Gen X or boomers? Or are you hearing that from the millennials and Gen Z? My guess is you're not hearing it from that younger generation. A related idea is that it's a relationship business. Well, we've already talked about what's happening in, with, with field sales from the Forrester data. Yes, it is a relationship business, but a lot of that is shifting. A lot of that is shifting to self-service through more convenient mechanisms. Some people think they've already got e-commerce. Hey, my guys can go on and order something. Um, we can do EDI. And well, okay, so I would say, yeah, that's e-business, but there's more to the story in e-commerce, uh, particularly if you're gonna try to compete against um, some of the other players in your space. Another objection we hear is it's too expensive and can't afford it. The prices or the cost of deploying e-commerce has dropped radically. I remember 15 years ago, I was building consumer uh, e-commerce sites um, and it was a two or two or two and a half million dollar uh, initiative to do that. Year over year, the cost and the price of that e-commerce initiative came down to less than 50,000 and, you know, for certain B2C things, it's, it's less than a thousand dollars to get going. So it's very affordable. We don't have the expertise. Okay, well, fine. That's a time to bring in the people that do have the expertise. And then the final thing is we're too busy. Um, if you look at that two to four year time frame that we think is the, the window of the tipping point, it takes a couple of years to get this stuff right. So it's really important to start now because it does take a couple years. So even if you're at the latter end of that range, it takes a couple or three years to really get this stuff going. Next slide, please. <clears throat> oh, let's, let's stay with the first part of that, Brian, Brian, thanks, yeah. So I think we all know the metaphor of the frog getting boiled one degree at a time. Um, and in this jolly um, photo here, they think it's a hot tub. In fact, I think one's got an ice cream cone there. That's, that's how good a time they're having. having. But if you, if you really look at what's going on, uh, next build, um, we think the temperature is about to go up precipitously. And we think that we are at a tipping point when we look at the totality of all of the changes and pressures that are happening. Uh, demographic, technology, competitive, um, all of those things are driving something where we think it's really about to go up precipitously. Okay, next slide, please. I want to talk a little bit about the shopping, buying, communication research we did. And, and this is something you might consider doing with some of your members to really clarify uh, what's happening in, in their business and in their customer base in terms of channel preference. As I mentioned, we've done this with um, 8,000 end users. It's about 20 distributors that have participated. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, so I think we all know Mark Cuban, and I'm gonna mention three things. Being an alumni from Indiana University, um, loving basketball, and having extreme wealth. 
I've got two of these things in common with Mark Cuban. I'll let you figure out which ones. Mark Cuban said something. It's not original, but it's to the point. He says, make your product easier to buy than your competition, or you'll find your customers buying from them, not from you. Actually, Charles Schwab figured this out in the 1990s. He figured out that we have to have people be able to go to a store or, or whatever they call their, their uh, offices, have to be able to do things online, have to be able to do things by phone, that the offerings that we, that we provide to somebody are based on the size of their portfolio. They have to be able to buy when and how they want to. Otherwise, you're going to lose them. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> So I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about two contrasting examples that we saw with uh, distributors whose customers participated in the survey that we did. The first is a very relational customer base. The distributor CEO was convinced that she needed to go build a very expensive e-commerce site. She had worked directly for Bill Gates at Microsoft back in the day. She'd worked at P&G, and it was a family-run business. That's an unusual path to becoming CEO in a family-run business. But she'd, she'd really seen other, other perspectives, and she, and she appreciated technology. <clears throat> when we did the research on how her customers most preferred to shop from, from her, from her business, um, we found that there was not much difference between searching, between going to a website, calling a customer service rep or calling a sales rep. Going to the manufacturer's rep website was de-emphasized. However, we saw much more pointed differences when we looked at how her customers wanted to buy. If you look at it on the right side of the, of the graph, it says email and by website with computer. That's a much lower preference than calling a customer service rep on the phone. So her business ended up being much more relational than transactional. Had she spent a million or a million and a half dollars on an e-commerce site, she would have been wasting money. She would have been overspending on capital dollars, over-engineering, um, and could have put that money to better use. So we said, don't do that. You know, you, you need the 100000 to $250,000 version of an e-commerce site. They've done that, and their, their market is coming along. Okay, next slide. We'll look at the contrasting. This is uh, next slide is a very transactional customer base. However, before we did the survey, the CEO of this company was convinced about how relational the customer base was. In fact, he wanted us to have his salespeople involved in crafting the survey and reviewing the survey results. But as you can see from the left side, the shopping preferences are heavily electronic. Search engine, distributor website. Turns out that manufacturers don't play such a big role in that business. Talking to a, 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 a CSR or to a field salesperson is, is much less emphasized relative to these digital means of shopping. And then the, on the buying side of things, the digital preferences are even more pronounced. You see sending orders via email, sending orders via website with computer, um, almost no preference for a face-to-face -face interaction going to the supplier's branch or store or having the supplier rep come to them, mild preference for talking to a supplier rep over the phone. So once again, the, the before belief was at great variance with, with the data, and the data showed that to this distributor, if you need to spend a half a million dollars in e-commerce based on the players that you're competing against, you shouldn't hesitate to do that. Of course, by all means, if you can get it done for less, you should do that. But what, whatever it takes to get it done right is going to be key to your business because otherwise you'll be losing customers. Next slide, please. So I don't mean this to be an eye chart. Um, what this represents are three different shopping methods, I'm sorry, buying methods, email, going to a website with a computer, talking to a, a, a rep over the phone. And each of these bars is the preference for a, a customer base. So if you look at the, the lavender bar, that's the largest one, that's almost 80%. Whatever customer base that is, and I don't remember, remember which it is, but that's, that's part of what we studied. That customer base has a huge preference for shopping or for buying by email. 
If you look at the lime green one a little further down, you can see that customer base doesn't have a very strong preference for buying by email. What I want you to take away from this is that the bars are different lengths. And what that means is that no two customer bases are alike in their channel preferences. Every customer base in terms of their preferences is a snowflake. It is unique in terms of the particular profile and emphasis in how they want to shop and buy. If I showed you the shopping data, we'd see the same type of things. So it's critical to get the data on your customer base. We, we published a report with Modern Distribution Management. I think it's a very good report. I encourage people to buy it. However, at the end of the day, what matters most to you is finding out what's happening in your customer base. Because as you can see, you can easily overspend or underspend. Next slide, please. Another thing that we've seen in the research we've done over a seven year period is the shift from wanting to talk to field sales to and, and having field sales visit to to more efficient mechanisms. You see in the in the data presented here, at least in terms of weekly, monthly, and quarterly, there's similar preference for a phone call to a sales rep visit. Um, and then if you look at the percentage who either never want a sales rep visit or want one annually, which is kind of like never, um, basically a third of the, of the respondents really aren't interested in seeing a sales rep. Um, so let's go to the next slide because I think it's, it's, really, um, it's really important to think about inside sales. As much as we talk about e-commerce, um, and certainly I, I love e-commerce. I, as, as Brian mentioned, I've got a PhD in computer science. We think that the next channel is to do something different with your inside sales than taking orders. So there is the simple customer service function, but there's other things that are more proactive that can actually generate more revenue. One is, uh, actually doing quote follow-up, having, having people dedicated to quote follow-up. Um, my guess is if you look at your quotes, probably a lot of them are un unattended. Another would be telemarketing, and there's a variety of functions with telemarketing. It could be setting up appointments, it could be prospecting, um, any number of things with telemarketing that you can do. The model that we prefer, at least in distribution, but also in manufacturing, is where the inside sales function actually is doing account management. So they're taking customers that have bought once and they're trying to, to, to drive repeat and recurring purchasing. They're, they're growing, they're retaining. So when you look at those functions, let's look at the next slide. The average inside sales rep um, can handle um, 200 to, to 300 customers versus a field sales rep who can really proactively sell 25 to 30, maybe 35 customers. At the end of the day, when we look at both inside sales and e-commerce, it's about your customer's efficiency. And so what we're seeing is this shift from either primarily or all field sales to, to, to digital, to this dedicated inside sales function. The effect for the customer is they get business done in 15 minutes or five, instead of 30 to 60 with a face-to-face -face visit. Of course, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. There are benefits for the distributor as well. The, you're reducing the cost per order. Um, we've heard numbers and seen numbers like 20 to $30 lower cost per order. And then that inside sales function, once it hits full efficiency, and it takes a few months, they can reach not just call, but actually reach and speak to 20 to 25 customers a day at seven to $9 per contact. If you think about your field sales function on a good day, they get to three or four, maybe, 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 maybe five customers if the routes line up and schedules line up perfectly. Admittedly, this is a smaller customer that, they, that the inside sales is reaching, but it's also much, much higher margin. It could be five to 10 points maybe even more higher margin than the, than the core accounts that the field sales is calling on. Next slide, please. 
So here's a way to think about shopping and buying as a function of the size of the customer and the age of the contact of the customer. At the, in the lower right-hand corner, we've got large customer and the contact is a boomer. Large customers merit the attention of field sales. It's worth the time to spend with a large customer for field sales. Boomers are going to be more comfortable with that more personal touch rather than the electronic touch. But as we go from that lar large customer boomer to now medium customer Gen X, so different age group, different size, we might start to see a hybrid of personal and electronic. And then finally, when we get to that smallest customer um, and it's a, it's a young contact there, it's going to be pretty much electronic. You as a, as a business don't have time for your field salespeople to spend with a small customer. Um, so they are going to self-serve electronically. Now we can nitpick this, this guideline. It is a guideline. Uh, if we look at the, at the boomer large customer, there may be uh, electronic data interchange, there may be punch out, there may be different kinds of e-business things that are happening. But this is, aside from that nitpick, this is directionally correct in terms of how you want to think about things. What it also means is you need to understand who your customer base is, right? You're, 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 uh, that person you're receiving the purchase order from or that you're selling to or that influencer, you need to know, are they millennial, Gen Z, Gen X, Boomer? You need to know more about them if you want to uh, have a better chance of, of reaching them. Next slide, please. So I've, I've talked a lot, I'm sorry, let's do these one at a time. I've talked a lot about um, the importance of getting channel right, um, you, you know, that you don't want to either overbuild or underbuild. And I think in the example I showed with the relational customer and the transactional customer, there's a cost of not knowing your customer base. You could overbuild or underbuild. If you overbuild, you're wasting money. If you underbuild, you under delight and you may lose customers. Keep going. Um, having too many or too few salespeople. I would argue that probably most companies have too many salespeople, but it's possible that you have too few salespeople right now. It's about getting your salespeople focused on the right accounts and, and knowing how many you need. If, if you were able to shed five or six or seven or eight percent of your salespeople and shift them to be inside salespeople, that's a big win for you in terms of costs. Next, please. In terms of your physical or plant infrastructure, if we think about that one relational or transactional business that he thought was relational, their customers have very little interest in walking into a store or a branch or a building doesn't mean you need no branches or buildings, but it does mean you probably need to rethink them. You need less real estate space. You need less counter space. You need to keep less inventory, fewer employees. Um, getting that right is, is, a, is important. The, the cost of getting it wrong is, is high. Next, please. There are other efficiencies in e-procurement, such as EDI or email order automation that can take huge costs out of your business by applying them appropriately. They don't have to be boil the ocean projects. Um, we've actually got a company we work with that will automate the receipt of email orders. So it'll go right into the, your financial system, generate an acknowledgement within five minutes. There are huge efficiencies that can be obtained here. Many companies are overlooking them uh, because they think, or they think they're too expensive or perhaps they are unaware of them. Next, please. Wrong media for the wrong generation. So if I send print to only print to the younger generation and only digital to the older generation, I will directionally be wrong. Of course, there are older generation who like digital and there are younger generation who like print. But as a broad brush stroke, if I don't know my customer base, I'm gonna probably end up using the wrong media um, for the generation. Next, please. I mentioned a couple of slides ago that the mid-market and smaller customers are much, much higher margin. 
if we if all we have is field sales, we're going to miss opportunities with those mid-market and smaller customers because field sales either can't or won't service those mid-market and smaller customers. Those are big. Those are big opportunities to create a steady revenue stream um, that is much higher margin. But we can't do it with field sales. We have to look to things like e-commerce and inside sales, uh, possibly doing things with EDI and procurement to make it more efficient. Next slide, please. So I think I think the imperative for everybody here is if you buy that we are at a tipping point, then that means we have to do something different. And I, I think that really means rethinking the business top to bottom. You have to really know what portion of your customer base is younger and how they want to shop and buy from you, not just today, but in the future. So if we look at the, the, met, the metaphor that uh, Wayne Gretzky said of, you know, he doesn't follow the puck, he knows where the puck's going. We want to know where it's going to be in a couple of years for, uh, for all of your customers. It's more important than ever to get a relevant and differentiated value proposition. We help companies create value propositions and at least in distribution, we see a pronounced sort of me too syndrome where everybody's got the same value proposition. For, for your members who are, if, if you have members that are distributors, probably most of your members are smaller. Um, and overwhelmingly, the smaller members can do things that, you're, that the largest competitors couldn't do in their wildest imagination and vice versa. But if the smaller member tries to compete with um, a, a Granger or an Amazon and the things that Granger or Amazon does well, they'll get crushed. So getting that value proposition right is critical, not just regurgitating what was passed down in a family run business from generation to generation that was really uninspected or not thought through. In terms of the, the multi-channel, when you start to look at these different things, whether it's email order automation or EDI, or inside sales or e-commerce, really create a full-blown ROI um, for what it's gonna to take to, to deploy this and what the return is gonna be. And there will be productivity benefits, there will be revenue benefits. You have to understand them all. It's not gonna be the case that each one of these channel offerings is relevant for every one of your members. Um, we just did one analysis for a company and we looked at four different programs or four different channels, it turned out inside sales was not a fit for who they were. <clears throat> As we look at this multi-channel, it's critical to integrate online and offline. Um, so for many companies, there's an opportunity to incorporate a customer relationship management or CRM system. That's a key piece that's going to tie to the ERP. But then there's other digital uh, things called marketing automation that you can tie into the CRM system that are that once you have these three things integrated, you're going to have a very good 360 degree view of your customer's behavior. What are they, what are they shopping for? What are they looking at on your website? What are they responding to in terms of email? Obviously the tie into the ERP, you're going to have, what are they, what are they actually buying? You know, we can see everything. But getting those things integrated and preventing a siloed scenario is critical. And then the final piece, or perhaps the result of this, is you want to enable your customers to shop and buy how they want, how they want to shop and buy from you and when they want to shop and buy from you. Can you advance one more slide, please, Brian? Start now. Um, again, I, I really feel the urgency when I look at the totality of all of this. Um, it, it's, it's critical to get going now because it does take a little while to get going. Okay, Brian, I think that concludes this portion of the presentation. Um, we, can, we can open things up for questions. Sure, just uh, I'm muting there. Um, you know, this is like, uh, it's a, to, to wade into this, um, it's, it's really like, it's a really interesting uh, issue. Uh, I think you've presented it in a really interesting and engaging way. And I think it really juxtaposes well also with um, some of the other webinars that we've been doing around uh, business intelligence 
and engaging members. Um, this is a, uh, it's really pulling in a lot of those different elements. Um, so I'm, I'm really glad that, that you were able to, to join today, Jonathan, and, and kind of walk through some of this. Um, some of my, I think, initial reactions and, and questions um, that, uh, that we've got uh, are around, you know, the, the HR implications maybe of, mm. of some of this stuff. Uh, you know, you've got field staff that are very good at being personable and that are very good at um, kind of those one-to-one -one relationships. You know, taking them out of the field, putting them behind a computer, behind a phone. You know, what's what's been sort of your experience in sort of you know any of the groups that you've worked with, them making that shift, or or at least what could be the implications of of some of that? Because it seems like you you need to identify. You know, if you can retrain, great. But if not, it's like you're you're looking to a different field of of people with a with a different skill set. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think if you look at the the con the consultative sales quadrant, right, in the Forrester Group, mm -hmm. I think yep. you want to keep those people in front of your customers. You want to keep that relationship warm and cultivated, whether it's doing entertainment or you know after work activities together, noticing the kid's birthday, sending cards. I mean, all those things that create that personal touch. Um, that being said. You, we have to also gauge what the customer wants. We may still have that relationship. But there just may be fewer face-to-face -face visits as part of what we're doing because the customer's looking for efficiency. Now, that may depend. In terms of the, the inside sales, um, a couple things that we've seen is that trying to convert your, your typical customer sales representative into a proactive account management inside salesperson very rarely works. I'd say less than 10% of the time you have the right makeup in customer service to make a transition to inside sales. When you think about getting an inside sales program going, and I have a colleague that's put together a number of these for customers and then did it in her career as an operating executive over the years, um, sometimes it's, it's challenging to get things going because you need to have expertise on products that you're selling. And one, one thing that we've seen that works a surprising amount is that there are often field sales reps who are getting ready to retire, but they don't really want to stop work entirely. Um, they've got the expertise. They've got the relationships. If, if some of those folks, some of those folks could be, could be coaxed or cajoled into sitting behind a phone just half time. So that keeps them going half time. They don't have to be bag carrying anymore. Um, it's really critical to get the right, the right talent um, in that inside sales role. I think in terms of the other channel stuff, um, a lot of it depends on the size of the organization. Um, so for, so for e-commerce, uh, there's, there's sort of two functions that are, that are important. One is what's happening with IT and the second is what's happening with marketing. For smaller businesses, you may need to outsource some or significant parts of those to make that work. So if you think about a business that's got 50 employees, you might have one IT person and there may be more involved in e-commerce than, than they are set to do or have time to do. And so things like hosting um, become a great option there where it's, it's somebody else's problem to make sure the, the site's up and running. In terms of marketing, um, a lot of what we've seen with smaller companies, whether it's manufacturer or distributor, is they may have a marketing communications person. And we think that that role, if, if you have just one person, uh, we think that that role needs to shift to include digital marketing. So somebody who can create emails um, over time can, can do things like search engine optimization, search engine marketing, things of that sort. Sure. So I think, and all that definitely definitely makes sense. And um, I think the the folks that are interested in this topic have been probably feeling this way for a while. I think the the roadblock they run into is kind of like those objections um, that you that you sort of laid out for. Um, you know, we don't have enough time, or it's too expensive. I thought what you presented on on the price drop was really interesting. Um, how it used to cost two million bucks, and now you can do it for 
fifty thousand, maybe even a thousand dollars, if you if you find the right uh, program or platform. Um, you know, and, and and kind of all that to say, you know, knowing the members, you know, you're you've been talking a lot about knowing the customers, knowing the members, and trying to get them and lead them down this path. I, I think is a very important piece of the discussion. You know, a lot of our members struggle with you know the Amazon, and and you mentioned you know price buyers and, and kind of what what the impacts of those, uh, how many of those people could you afford to lose um, to Amazon? Um, so, you know, what would you, if you could talk to the members, you know, cause I think, like I said, the, the purchasing, the leadership of these purchasing co-ops and just, you know, the consumer co-ops, whomever, I think they understand sort of that there's a change coming, but the members, um, what are, are there any kind of like, you know, just key things that you found has really been able to open their eyes to give them that aha moment to help them understand um, that this is a real issue and that if they want to have an enduring business and keep roots in the community that they need to start embracing some of these things. Is, is there an aha moment or like an elevator pitch or, or something that that our, our, our leadership folks here in the co-op community could sink their teeth into and, you know, repurpose to their members? I think um, I think a lot of the data presented here, if you look at it, the I've used the word totality. If you look at the totality of the data, it says that you can't ignore this any longer. I think the specific comment to the members would be, you may have heard the expression, um, data is not the plural of anecdote. Sure. Data is not the plural of anecdote. So a lot of what people have is they hear from their biggest customers. Their biggest customers say, well, we don't care about e-commerce. That's right, because you, biggest customer, command the attention of my field sales. But when you get to the other 90% of your customers that don't command the attention of field sales, they, they, they sure as heck do care about e-commerce and being able to self-serve. So I would say really get that voice of your customer. Get beyond the anecdotal stuff of what field sales and your, your biggest 100 customers are telling you. Um, Actually, if you go to the last slide, by the way, there's just a slight plug here. We we can help people with that. Um, but I think getting that voice of the customer, there's no substitute. Uh, you know, buy, buying the report that we did is great. Um, but getting that voice of, of your customer base is going to tell you, hey, hey uh, one more slide, uh, is going to tell you, hey, you know, is is my customer base, you know, pushing for this stuff in two years? Or are they more at the fore end, your end of the spectrum? And that will help you figure out the urgency of what your customer base is requiring. So get beyond the anecdotal data. Yep. And I think it's, you know, again, I, I mentioned the other webinars that we've been, we've been doing, um, or specifically around business intelligence. You know, the, uh, the conversation that we've had is sort of examining, well, what is it? Um, just, you know, digging deep in, deeper into it, like, okay, you know, data analytics, all that stuff, how, define business intelligence. Um, and then, you know, the, the second part really looked at, um, you know, gave a couple examples about, you know, folks that had implemented business intelligence and what they were able to learn. And then we're, we're going to have a discussion, I think a little bit around, um, you know, you, once you've got that data, how do you, um, how do you make it purposeful and make it intentional to to change your business? Um, so I think it's you know it's great that that we've got you you know looped into these conversations because you know this is this is certainly what what you guys excel at. Um, I'm I'm curious to know you know from that that sort of BI uh, perspective, um, what has been maybe some like a success story or something like that where you've had you've presented this data and you've got uh somebody that was just super just struggling and they they were able to implement the data and understand and sort of you know explore all these channels and really you know redefine their business kind of they hit that tipping point they did rethink their business as you said um do you have something that you could share um as a real world example that, that people might be able to get inspired around we've got a number of clients that we've done that with um, I mean, I think it's, I think it's a longer case thing, but I, I can tell you, we've got one client right now. Um, they are shifting customers up to $50,000 a year in revenue into inside sales. 
Um, so, I mean, we, we see these we see these e-commerce in, initiatives succeed uh, in a number of, a number of companies. We've seen the inside sales succeed. Uh, we've got another client that's that's done it all uh, with our guidance along the way, um, and they are starting to see the benefits of that against their their competitor. Awesome. Well, um, we've got your information up there. Um, a little bit more about the survey. Um, I'm happy to point people uh, to you. Uh, for for any more information on this kind of thing, we're right at our two o'clock mark, so um, I think we're going to shut it down and, and we can reconvene offline. But you know, Jonathan, thanks again for for leading us through some of this today. Um, you know, at, for for those on the line or those listening after the fact, obviously the webinar has been recorded. Uh, you'll receive a link uh, to that recording tomorrow, and you can of course always view it on our uh, ncba.coop webinars page. Uh, we do have an archive where we keep these. Um, if you're looking for more information specifically about purchasing cooperatives, or if you're interested in the Cooperative Impact Conference to be held October 4th through the 6th in Washington, D.C., you can go on our website, ncba.coop, uh, or you can just email me, bmunson at ncba.coop, and I'll be happy to get back to you. Uh, it's been my pleasure to, to talk to you, Jonathan, today and, and to host you and, and uh, for our audience, for their attention. Um, Again, look for this recording uh, of the webinar, and um, thanks again, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, Brian.